neighborhood improvements and investments that would advance growth and development over the next eight years. And um, we, from the very beginning, branded issue nine, so folks could potentially remember it easier than issue nine, as your dollars, your neighborhoods, because so many of the investments were speaking directly to quality of life. So the promise was to maintain um, and strengthen or improve public safety. This was the budget that was laid out, an annual budget. Um, residential road resurfacing uh, was a high priority. Uh, vacant lot mowing because many of the neighborhoods were very, or residents were very frustrated with the mm -hmm. amount of vacant lots and the conditions of which they were in. And recall those were some really tough years, uh, as well as park improvements. Uh, making sure that we were not only just maintaining our parks, but reinvesting in them. And then preschool promise to try and um, support our youngest residents as they um, begin their educational endeavor. So $11 million and uh, for a total for all eight years, $88 million. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Ms. Lofton, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the progress as well, Mr. Parlett, and then I'll come back and wrap. Good morning, and thank you again um, for the opportunity to share with you um, the city's progress in meeting our commitment and our promise uh, regarding how we would spend um, the resources that our Dayton citizens uh, afforded mm -hmm. us with that additional quarter percent increase. Um, first, I want to turn it over to Mr. Parlett and let him give you a little um, update about what happens has happened to date with public safety uh, forces. Thank you, Lachey. Um, <clears throat> I'll tackle police first, um, and then I'll, I'll address the, uh, the fire commitment. Uh, from a police perspective, when uh, the, the ordinance was passed in July of 16, we took a snapshot in time of the existing mm -hmm. staffing in police, and it was 345 at that time. So with the issue nine commitment, we said we're going to add 20 officers to make an authorized staffing of 365. So <clears throat> since then, we, we have been hiring to attrition, right, to try and gain. So in 2017, obviously, we wanted to get a big step forward. We hired way more than uh, attrited out to get some growth going uh, and some forward momentum so that by 2024, we would be on average at 365. Um, the closest we came to that was in, in 2019, we had 364 on average. So we would have gotten there earlier uh, by a small margin, um, but for uh, attrition uh, that is really unlike anything we've seen in history. Uh, for Parlett, may I please stop and pause you for a minute? Sure. Um, we are not as I was concerned, sharing this right now, public can't see this. So I'm turning to some technical assistance uh, folks to see if they can help us. Abby? <laughs> we can redo. <laughs> Other duties as assigned. We'll Abby. be, po you know, obviously we'll, but I want to make sure that this. All right, let's do a check. Verletta, see if, it, if we can hear, be heard. <laughs> Okay, apparently we're good. All right, so didn't miss much if you didn't hear this first part, so we'll start with the progress, Joe. So uh, as I mentioned, our commitment from a police perspective with issue nine was to add 20 officers on average. Um, so we were well on our way as of 2019 uh, to uh, fulfill that commitment in 2024. Uh, obviously, at times to get an average, you are well above 365, uh, and we did that over uh, that period of time. Um, what we've experienced since uh, really could not have been predicted, uh, but we've been responding. Um, for example, um, it, we've hired 116%, so over those positions that have been vacated. And police. So we've we've hired 220 when we've lost 190. So we're we've been trying, obviously. Uh, in that same time frame, though, 
only 87% or 192 of those 220 have been uh, sworn in. So they completed the process, graduated, or applied for, through our lateral process, which was also another strategy uh, deployed last year uh, to add officers and lateral transfer, not just the traditional method of recruiting. Um, what we will say, though, is that every single year since 2017, we budgeted for 365 officers. Um, in addition, uh, we provided over $10 million in capital investments to the Dayton Police Department, aside from uh, you know, the, the commitment and the budget for 365 officers. So the attrition uh, in the last two years um, double, uh, if not more, than what we normally experience. Um, so in response, more than double, uh, recruits have seated uh, for the academy. Um, I'll give you an example. This class that is about to graduate, prior to the accident a couple of weeks ago, we expected, we sat 32, and we expected 16 to graduate. Now that number looks like it might only be 14. Um, so when we normally attrit in a, in a class two, maybe three, over 50% attrition in a class is unheard. So from that perspective, we're looking at everything, how we're actually conducting the academy, the curriculum, and how it's timed out uh, throughout uh, the, the six months, um, as well as obviously the recruiting. Um, we just sat six laterals, uh, which is we're optimistic that all six of them will make it through. Um, but from a budgeting perspective, we're still planning to respond to that attrition in 2024. You may recall from last week, we've got two classes planned, very aggressive recruiting. So we're still hopeful that hopefully this, this attrition experience this year in this particular class is an anomaly and we'll get back to what we experienced. But our plan, both through traditional academy classes and laterals, is to get to that committed number um, by the end of 2024, or 2025, sorry, 25. Uh, so that's the, the police landscape. Uh, key takeaway, we budgeted 365 mm -hmm. officers every single year. Um, from a fire perspective, our commitment with issue nine was to maintain services and invest in capital. So at same snapshot in time in 2016, there, we authorized seven engines, four ladders, seven medics, two district chiefs, and one incident support unit, which is basically like the chief paramedic uh, on duty every single day. So since then, not only have we, as you can see in the graph, that's exactly the staffing level that you see represented there, um, but not only have we done that, We've also, in response to the opioid epidemic in 2017, we upped that an eighth engine. Um, we did the same in 2018, uh, upped staffed an eighth engine, and also started investing in paramedic training, where we pay office to pay firefighters to go become certified paramedics uh, on our dime. Uh, we pay for their tuition, we pay the overtime to backfill their positions. Um, so that program over uh, three years, 18, 19, and 20, represented, you know, roughly $1.2 million that we committed to uh, staffing in the uh, fire department. Um, and also in 2020, we upstaffed again uh, due to the, the pandemic and everything unknown at the time in 2020. Um, but what you'll see in 2023 was the addition of Ambulance 11, which enabled Medic 10 to be in service. Uh, this year. Um, so we're responding to the uh, unprecedented increases in U.S. calls uh, in that manner. Uh, and furthermore, for 2024, if you recall from last week, the city manager has authorized the uh, cross-staffing of Engine 10 uh, in 2024, which cross-staffing means the first 12 hours of the day, there will be two additional medic units 
able to respond to EMS calls when the, that's the prime time for EMS calls. And then the second 12 hours of the day it will be a fire engine when you should you well know that overnight is our, our biggest risk for, for fire loss and potential uh, fatality. Um, so <clears throat> at the end of the day, we have delivered our commitment uh, and continue to prioritize our commitment when it comes to public safety services. Back to Ms. Love. Thank you, Joe. So the um, other major priority that um, Issue 9 uh, committed to fund was, of course, residential road resurfacing. Uh, and we said we would fund $3.4 million every year for a total of $23.7 million, uh, $23 million through 2017's allocation. To date, um, we are very close at that number. We've spent $22.3 million. Uh, and 239 residential lane miles across all of our neighborhoods have been paved since 2017. Uh, Dayton went from uh, resurfacing only 4% of our residential streets with issue nine funding to a cumulative total of 27% in 2023. And the graphs there speak for themselves. Of course, the PCI pavement index has improved uh, greatly from 49.63, which was a poor condition overall, to satisfactory. And you can see uh, on the, the graph on your left that every neighborhood has seen an increase in that PCI index, which is elevating the overall PCI for the city of Dayton. I also want to make sure you understand that in addition to issue nine proceeds, this program is also supported by allocations from the city's general capital program, as well as community development block grant and other sources. All told, all other funding sources was $19.6 million over this seven year period. Um, and when you add that to the issue nine funding, we have spent over 41, uh, almost $42 million to ensure that our residential streets are paved and that the condition ratings uh, are up to uh, the satisfactory goal that we've all intended. Um, next what was vacant land mowing. And this was simply uh, making sure vacant lots through all of, throughout our community were well maintained. Um, we committed to $572,000 annually for a total of $4 million through 2017. And to date, we have spent $4.2 million. Um, and so this, um, this number means that there has been some additional funding uh, that has come forward to support this program initiative. And, and consequently, then Public Works has been able to increase that number of vacant lots that we're mowing uh, five mm -hmm. rounds uh, throughout the year by 3,300 lots. Um, funding has also been used to purchase all of the equipment necessary um, to uh, ensure this service is delivered throughout our community. We've purchased mowers and flatbeds and trucks and spreaders and all of that. Um, the other part of this budget also included um, by your um, authority last year, we were able to increase uh, the number of uh, personnel that was assigned to do this work. So um, overall, I think we have done very well here. And in addition to um, the 4.2 million that we've spent through 2017 with issue nine money, we've also spent an additional uh, nearly $500,000 from the Dayton recovery plan. Um, and so, I'm sorry, that's for parks. I got ahead of myself. Um, so we have spent additional money. And again, as you can see, about two, $300,000 um, for vacant land mowing. And this, this commitment continues, as you will see later in our 2024 budget as well. So uh, as I got excited talking about our park improvements, you'll see here the commitment was $1.7 million for six seven, through seven years. We've spent that and then some of $469,000 from the recovery plan has also been um, applied to, to add more parks uh, to, to the improvements in our inventory. The chart there shows you um, the number of parks that, that we've been able to uh, complete each year. Uh, and it's usually two to three, uh, sometimes four, depending on uh, funding. One of the things I will note here uh, is that as we have gone through these years, the cost of doing uh, business and providing these services has increased as well. And so I think uh, it's very impressive that we have been able to continue to meet the commitment, even though costs have continued to rise uh, over the course of the seven year period. And then of course, um, Preschool Promise is um, 
certainly uh, one of the priorities, uh, the final priority that was uh, funded through issue nine. We had a commitment of $4.3 million annually, which is $30.1 million, uh, and we've spent $24.6 million. And with that, we have had over 10,000 children who have attended preschool promise partner sites, which is an 11% and an 11% increase in four-year-olds since its inception. Nine out of 10 preschool promise children are now attending five-star preschool sites. And most of those sites are in the city. Over, this, over the last two years, 50% of preschool lead teachers have participated in intens intensive professional develop to improve their instruction. And of course, that was the goal, not just to put children in preschool, but to put children in preschools that were um, high quality. And of course, the base of that high quality comes with the level of instruction. So the more um, training uh, and, and qualified the teachers are, the better the results are for the young people attending. You'll see in that chart to the left, um, a, that's a total of about 17, uh, 1788 young people in the 2022-23 school year and how they broke out geographically and where they were served. So there were 756 young people in Northwest, 408 in Southwest, 287 in Northeast, and 337 in Southeast. So this is just the spread and breakdown of the young people, our young people, Dayton's young people, and, and who has been getting served where through Preschool Promise. And so we think this is um, an impressive start and this is where they are now. Uh, and so it's gonna continue to grow, especially since they added three-year-olds uh, last year. All right, so let's summarize here just briefly. Um, over the whole entire uh, seven year period, we, have, we had committed $77,339,000. We have spent 70,000 which is a million. 70 million, sorry. <laughs> Zeros are important. 77 million uh, was budgeted, 70 million has been spent for a 91% rate. I wanna draw to your attention, however, um, Preschool Promise, uh, we, that money was received, uh, they receive it based on their school year, which is about six months later than our calendar year starts. So that little note is in my way, but um, I have it here. It's basically if we adjust um, the 27, the total seven year commitment by six months, they actually have spent about 88% of their funding and will continue to draw down, but they're drawing across our fiscal year, um, their fiscal year, their calendar year and our fiscal year do not line up. So um, altogether though, we are, we are probably about 93% funded uh, considering um, that difference. I also wanna just remind you again that this is just issue nine funding that has been spent. We have submitted, uh, committed several dollars um, outside of that altogether, the 19.6 million in asphalt resurfacing from other funds, the 469,000 for parks out of ARPA, and the $31 million that has been invested through, in public safety through technology, equipment, and fleet totals another $51.1 million that we have provided to the community to ensure these priorities uh, are delivered and delivered well. So in terms of finishing strong, we wanted to make sure um, you all knew and you all have seen the budget presentation. These dollars are, are there. Um, but the same commitment uh, continues. And so in 2024, we will be allocating, uh, a pending your approval, the $11 million for those five uh, priority areas. And then our eight-year total will be at $88.4 million, um, which exceeds the $88 million commitment that we made in 2017. So... Hopefully it is very clear that we have been delivering on the issue nine promise from 2016. We've made significant improvements and advances uh, in our neighborhoods in the last seven years. Is our work done? No, but we have made significant strides. Uh, after eight years, the need for reinvestment will continue in every neighborhood. You know, we know that, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, progress and improvement is a cycle and has to be not only reinvested, but maintained as those reinvestments occur. Uh, we also know that with our ARPA funding uh, in 2024 that we presented, we, we've been presenting over the last 
two years that we will continue more investments in our neighborhoods. We have bolstered um, economic infusion uh, into our neighborhoods with those one-time sources of funds. And 2024 will continue with the bulk of the demolition funding, with the housing funding, with the sidewalks and um, streetscape or sidewalks and curb funding. Uh, so, um, but as you all know, that funding does come to an end and sunsets. And so being able to continue to dedicate funding and drive funding into neighborhoods, into those basic core services, into the infrastructure that so represents quality of life and those um, amenities like our parks is obviously very important yet. So the if, if there is not a renewal of issue nine, then that is a 14 to $15 million hole that is created into the operating budget. That um, 14 to 15 in whole, if we if we lost all 14 to 15 million dollars, that could represent up to 200 jobs in the city that would get um, eliminated. You know, and yes, you could make some arguments that if if preschool promise went away, that there's no staffing, city staffing of preschool promise. So maybe it's it's 11 million dollars instead of 15 and that's still 150 jobs that have to be cut in the city or something representative, $10 million cuts in, in the operating budgets to be able to, make, to have a, a balanced budget. So that concludes, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. We have a, a takeaway slide as I so like to, as I so like to have. Um, so again, year-to-date spending through year seven, it sits at about 91% completion. Uh, additional funding, including general fund dollars, as Ms. Lofton pointed out, have been allocated to the five priority areas, improving and leveraging the issue nine funding, um, creating the impacts that we talked about. Preschool, uh, is paying dividends by preparing students. I think I mentioned to you in the in the work session, over 10,000 Dayton kids for the seven years have attended Preschool Promise and are benefiting directly from that, as well as you know, the workforce that sits in those preschools delivering those services and creating higher quality educational opportunities for our three and four-year-olds. Um, we're also delivering to our customers. You know, Ms. Lofton said every neighborhood has benefited from issue nine. We have paved roads in every neighborhood. Every neighborhood's PCI index has risen because of that $42 million of investment that we've put into roads. And we've engaged residents in how those services and improvements are made and, and seeing the results together. So. Can't stop now, need to keep going. Um, lots of work left to do, um, but um, very inspiring results uh, as it relates to um, the last seven years of work. Yeah, I think it's clear. Uh, the progress has been made. Uh, clearly, never are we where we want to be, uh, but clearly uh, the, the pathway is more clear. Right here. And uh, those benefits have um, created additional investments from outside the city. And it's caused us to be accelerated, if you will, when we start looking from the benefit of the city as a whole. Uh, uh, questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, Mr. Yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, early on, you talked about how we got here. What was the second ordinance that was passed alongside the first ordinance that helped to shape um, your neighborhood, your dollars, your dollars, your neighborhood. I'm sorry, are you referring to one of the points made? Yeah. Um, on how we got to on, page, on slide four? Yes. So you mentioned one ordinance. There was a second ordinance that was passed that my my um, understanding is there's an ordinance and a resolution that come okay. Um, to essentially put it on, um, put it before Board of Elections. And then later on, there was an ordinance that talked specifically about 
um, preschool promise and the operational services, I believe. But that was that was something to try and ensure livability um, with regards to the fund that for the preschool promise. But if we could get that second ordinance, I think it's there helpful. for you on the, on the on the slide. Um, all of the each of these. This is the ordinance, and this was the resolution um, okay. that Shelley spoke of that uh, authorized uh, putting it on the ballot. No, but I'm talking about the additional ordinance that came later, right? That puts it on the well, ballot. preschool promise. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, the one that defines the operating. You know, there was an ordinance that we passed that said we're going to spend 4.3 million on preschool promise. In general, yeah, we can. We laid out those. That, that was a that was one that I believe came later. I could be. I'll double check, um, but I will get that for you. Okay. Just a clarifying. Yeah, it was, it was, these, these were the actions to really take to, you know, to put it on the levy uh, or on the ballot. And then um, there was further conversation and um, the ordinance that basically outlined general operating services and then preschool promise. Right. Yeah, it was designed to establish what you saw today in terms of us being able to demonstrate what we say we were going to do at that time and so what we're saying today that we've done what we said we were going to do and um so the revenue that has been generated by this increase in, in tax levy it's increased what four percent from roughly 11 million to 15 million um, how are we going to spend that additional, um, we haven't kind of, the money, the additional, the 51 million, was that taken out of that surplus in the tax revenue? So we've been replugging the additional revenue back into the budget. Again, as I spoke, we, over seven years, the cost of doing business has also increased. Right, right, right. So the value of that difference shrinks as costs rise and we are still able to meet the commitment. So the difference has been plugged back into operations, specifically in the safety forces. So to answer your question, there's not an extra $4 million necessarily because it's going to cost more to deliver these packages, right? So we're going to increase each of those amounts. So the budget is, the budget is similar items and yes, Taking it up to instead of eleven, it'll it'll show fifteen million or so. Good. And I guess that last question, Miss Lofton spoke of the fifty-one million. I think that was spent yes. in addition to the seventy-seven so far. Yes, and some of that does include some of this difference because we've plugged it into capital. It's one time sources. And when we do year-to-day transfers, as you remember the, with the last appropriation, we move some of that money out of operating so that we can purchase and do some of the capital improvements that are necessary. So in 2024 or 2023 even, we moved uh, money out of operating because we had a little bit of extra and are putting it into residential resurfacing. So residential resurfacing is going to get an extra you know, boost in terms of its budget this year. What's the total amount that additional revenue has provided and that number's not here in addition to the 88 million or 77 what's the, what's the total over seven years what's the total amount that's been generated for issue nine yeah 80 well 77 through year seven and then because it's 11 million dollars a year is that what you're asking well no i mean it's point Two five of our income revenue, right? Right. It's, it's one tenth of our income. It's revenue. eleven. It, it generates eleven million dollars annually. Well, we collected like in twenty twenty one. We generated. We collected one hundred forty five. So wouldn't it be or one hundred forty six in income taxes, right? So wouldn't it be fourteen point six? Yes. To answer your question, yes, and. So some years um, it, it has exceeded because, you know, uh, 
collections have uh, grown right. over time, which we didn't anticipate in 2016. But as Ms. Lawson pointed out, that money goes back into capital. So the number you're asking for, we I don't think we have as we sit here, but for rough purposes, say it's an extra three million each year. So 21 million, and Ms. Lofton suggests that 51 is what we've actually invested. So even that difference that we didn't project or budget, the budget is 11, we experience 15, we throw it back in. But we can get that. that yeah, we can get That's that. That's not a problem. Thank you. Um, pretty good. I'm, I mean, this is um, a very good presentation and uh, talking about how we are hitting our marks, except a little hook up with uh, safety forces. Right. Yeah, but that's expected and that's happening across this country. And I, when I think about that, I think about um, in terms of the gap, how much worse it could be. So, uh, I, yeah, I appreciate the work. This is pretty clear. Issue um, nine has been effective. Yeah. Mr. Jessel? You know, I've been involved in city government and federal government and all kinds of different levels of government. And to have a multi-year project, uh, say it's going to do one thing and spend a certain amount of money and then do it, doesn't happen every day. It takes really close control. It takes hard work and monitoring and dedication and pulling it off. I really love this. Uh, so that's my first comment is uh, this is exactly what we needed. Uh, at the time, uh, it's continuing to work. And I want to thank you all for managing to, to manage this through. Uh, the second is, and I know I'm going to steal your thunder because there's another slide, but we really need to mention a thank you to the residents who let us do this. Uh, we worked really hard to go out and listen and find out what people needed. Uh, we worked really hard to, to give them that, and we are. And uh, I'm really proud of us, uh, but we want to make sure we thank the residents who voted this in. Let's do this. That's all I got there. Thank you. I think this is a, a great example of there was clear policy direction given in 16 um, and and the administration worked really hard to execute on that policy direction. And there are dashboards that were created and, you know, that allow very uh, large degrees of transfer, transparency so people can follow real time on the investments that are happening, whether it's lots or recreation or parks or um, streets you know so it's a real opportunity i just think it's a perfect example of how it works right yes. well what's great about it is that it has touched every single neighborhood so you know sometimes we hear a narrative about how uh, we're not uh, impacting every neighborhood well that's inaccurate you know, and it's demonstrated by, by this so i really appreciate it no it's good yeah. you know uh as um mr joseph mentioned you know, I've been involved with uh, uh, state budgets, federal budgets, uh, primarily dealing with education. And then also when I was a lobbyist for the uh, Indiana Audio, I was uh, also the, uh, uh, the the person who dealt with local, state uh, and state local government in terms of things that are happening from the municipalities. Uh, budgeting process is always challenging, but as was mentioned, when you see or have these dollars that come to the community, and you're able to, to plan how to use those dollars, and then you're able to stay on that plan. Uh, that's, that's remarkable. I think the other thing to, um, uh, to look at is to, from a benefit perspective is that this helped to stabilize uh, a city that was going clearly in the wrong direction. We're going the wrong direction for a number of decades. And we said 50, I think we're close to about 50 decades going the wrong direction because of patchwork that had to be done because of no additional dollars coming into the city. Um, uh, taking into consideration all the things that were happening relative to job losses, you know, closure rates, all those kind of things that happened to minimize the quality of life that was happening as far as the city of Dayton was concerned. And then looking at how this also generated additional dollars uh, that you were referring to because of more businesses coming into the city, more employees coming into the city, and those dollars, the we cut that dollars that came into the mix. I recall doing some of the uh, conversations in 2016 for some reasons not to support this uh, tax increase uh, were some who were confused about what Learn to Earn was going to do. Uh, they may not have a clue about what they have been doing or what they were going to do. 
I think a lot of that has uh, clearly been shown to be beneficial as far as uh, the city is concerned, and certainly students in terms of those preschool programs. I think another issue was the issue in terms of talking about people who were poor. Clearly, we had a situation where we had people who were poor. Our medium income in, I think, 2014, 2015, was somewhere in the neighborhood of $28,000. We're in a situation right now where we're somewhere around thirty-six, maybe thirty-seven thousand dollars in terms of median income as far as the city of is concerned. So, start, when we start looking at the kinds of things that happen, because not just because of issue nine, but that was sort of stimulated because of issue nine, puts us in a, a much better position. And I would hate to think about what we would be doing or where we would be if we have to look at making any kind of cuts in terms of what we're dealing with right now. Uh, the wind's behind our back in terms of things that we're doing, and I certainly want to help us keep it there. Thank you, staff, all the businesses that have contributed uh, because their employees will help to generate these dollars coming to the city. So uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.